which is called Going All Out. If you haven't done that and you'd like to, there are forms back here. There's only a couple left, so I guess we don't have much faith that many of you are going to do this anymore. But there, uh, I have one, if you'd like it. And, and uh, this, we have nine months left. We're actually halfway through this campaign. If you'd like to pledge the rest of the way, uh, you can pledge a weekly amount or monthly amount or, you know, daily amount if you're feeling really good um, to, to help us get to where we're going. We still need, here's the good news. The good news, well, there's a lot of good news, right? We have 12 acres debt-free. I mean, that's, who could do that? Um, and fully graded, and we don't owe anyone a dime right now on this property. That's what God has done through this thing. Now, we need some more money to get a building up instead of a tent, and that's, that's where we're headed, and we know that the Lord's going to somehow provide because he's done it up to this point. I don't know how he's going to do it. It's a mystery, but I know he's going to do it in some way. One of the ways he's going to do it is through us as we continue our faithful giving, and so that's the way you can, you can participate in that to a greater extent if you would like to, and if you're visiting with us today and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I knew churches would get to want my money at some point. Don't worry about it, all right? That's, that's, if the Lord lays it on your heart, great. But that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed. Uh, we also have, and I don't see them back there, we need to get some brochures that tell the story of our property, which is an amazing story. So sometime before the end of the service, I think I'm going to want to find some of those and, and get them back there because it really is an amazing story how God has taken that initial piece of property that we didn't even have the money for and turn it into 1.3 million, which, which led to what you see today. So it, it's truly his story. The only reason I'm excited about this is because I can see so clearly what he's doing and not what I'm doing, and that uh, gives me a lot of hope because if it were what I'm doing, then I don't have much hope. But if it's what God's doing, I have a lot of hope. And so that's, that's where we're headed. Let's, let's give God a hand again for all of that stuff. As we move into the book of Acts, which is really the story of what God did with the early church, which has led to us today. But let's pray first, all right, and thank God for where he's, where he's taken us. Lord Jesus, as we look at those images, those pictures, and we see, um, we see evidence of your miraculous works. Lord, you told your disciples, that, that first band of believers, that you wanted them to go make other disciples and they were faithful to that uh, it, and it's resulted in your your gospel being spread throughout the world and we are recipients of it and and the command to make disciples is still in play it's what you have for us to do and we saw that in acts chapter one you told your disciples again i want you i want you to be my witnesses you you took them off of the focus of when are you coming back and we know you're coming back, and that, that's wonderful news. But you basically told them when that happens is, is really none of your business. What is your business is right now to go be my witnesses. And so, Lord, help us to be your witnesses in this place, in this time, and in this community. Help us, Lord, to even tell the story of that property. We know that, that land is just land. But that place is special because you have taken notice of it and and you have done some amazing things and as we tell that story it's not about us and it's not about the property it's about what you've done and we can't we can't deny that and that's that gives us great hope and it gives us great excitement so lord thank you for where you have us in the journey of rock ridge church teach us today from your word in jesus name we pray amen all right we're in acts again the very end of chapter two and uh, I kind of divided this message up. Last week I did the first part of it. There was only one point, and this week we're going to do the final three points. Dwight L. Moody was a great evangelist in the 19th century. Many of you have read about him, heard about him. And he was planning to do a campaign in England. And uh, as, as word of that campaign he was going to do in England got, uh, got around to the English, an elderly English pastor was somewhat protesting it. And he was saying, why do we need this Mr. Moody from America to come here? You know, it's sort of the typical English, you know, they can be seen as a little bit of arrogance. Wait, we don't need this guy. Uh, who does he think he is? He's, he's not educated. He's, uh, he's kind of a simple man. Why do we need him here? Who does, he, does he think he has a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? 
A younger, wiser pastor rose and responded, No, but the Holy Spirit has monopoly on Moody. And that makes all the difference in the world. We're looking at the first church, and it was a Spirit-filled church. And we're going to see what that means for us and how spirit, being Spirit-filled results in the things that we see happening in Acts chapter 2. So starting at verse 42, here's what it says. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had any need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. In this passage, Luke describes a spirit-filled church. Our job today, and really our job throughout our existence as a church, is to is to make sure that we as individuals are being filled with the Spirit continuously, as Paul talks about, because a Spirit-filled church is made up of Spirit-filled individuals. It can't be a Spirit-filled church without Spirit-filled individuals. So it starts with me, and it starts with you. And as we look at this passage today, I think the most useful thing for us to do as individuals will be to say and to, to ask ourselves as a person, am I being influenced by the Spirit more than anything else, or are there other things that are pulling my affection and my time and my energies away from being filled with the Spirit? And what does that mean for me? All right? So we, last week, we saw the first, the first characteristic of the Spirit-filled church is that it was a, a learning church. A Spirit-filled church is a learning church. It talks about how they, how they, um, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And we talked here about how in America we've become a little bit biblically illiterate. We, we just don't know what's there. And if we don't know what's there, we can't think biblically. Spirit-filled people have a hunger for God's Word because the Holy Spirit has a hunger for us to know God's Word. And if He's, if he's moving us and if He is influencing us, it will come about that we'll have a hunger for God's Word. And so we talked about that last week. Second point we're going to start on today is this. The Spirit-filled church is a loving church. Here's what it says in verses 44 through 45. And they devoted themselves, or starting in verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the fellowship, and all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now I want you, I, I want again, just brief review. They devoted themselves to four basic things. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to worship, and the prayers. And that's what they were doing. Those were the things they devoted themselves to. And from that devotion to these basic, to these basic things came the application that we are seeing here. They didn't set out to do this, but this is what happened as they devoted themselves to the fellowship. Now this word fellowship is, would you agree with me, overused in Christian circles today? It's overused. As a result of that, it has lost its punch with us. It, 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 in fact, very often that's what it means, punch and cookies in the foyer. Now it's coffee. We don't drink punch so much anymore. We used to, in my, when I was a kid, it was punch every time we got together, man. It was pretty cool for a kid. But we don't do that anymore. We drink we're coffee. In fact, when you're nine, you're drinking coffee now, right? Your kids, they're going to Starbucks, and they're getting these complicated coffee drinks already at the age of nine. Well, we, we drank punch. But what does the word really mean? Well, it, it, it's a word that, that was kind of coined by the gospel writers, and, and it means, of course, to have things in common. It's a relation between individuals which involves a common interest and a mutual active participation in that interest and in each other. Let me say that again. Fellowship is a relation between individuals which involves a common interest and a mutual active 
participation in that interest and in each other. In other words, there's something about fellowship where we as a people are looking out at something else, not ourselves so much, but we're looking at the thing that, that, that brings us together, and we together are involved in what that thing is. Uh, if you want to look at it like this, it, it's been said that uh, in the Four Loves by C.S. Lewis, he said that lovers look at each other and gaze at each other. Friends are, not that lovers can't do it, but friends are looking out at something else, a common interest, and they're walking side by side in that interest. And that's probably a better idea of what fellowship is. Two individuals or more looking at something that, that they have in common, and as they, as they pursue that, they're actually growing closer to one another. By the way, that's a good thing for a marriage, too, if you haven't figured that out. It's not all about just use a couple, but that other thing that's out, every time I put my arm up, I guess, um, that other thing that's out there, and as you get closer to that, to that other thing, you get closer to one another. So, you'll figure it out, so I don't have to worry about it. That's what fellowship is. Fellowship is that, so now what is it that You're doing that, but that's well. Let's try. Everybody, draw. Everybody, give Gloria a hand, and uh, give Jim a hand back there. Common. They have. They, they. They. They are unified around a common purpose, which is, which is to make sure we have sound here, which, which is needed. Thank you, Gloria. All right. We got up there. Are we back on. Are we back on here. All right. Testing one, two, three, four. This is your nine o'clock. All right. Good. Now. I think the emphasis here needs to be that their allegiance to Jesus and their pursuit of obedience of Jesus trumped everything else in their life. It, it trumped it all. It, it was more important to them than, than anything, more, more important than their job, and some of them actually lost employment because they came into the church. Their career, even their family. I mean, it was Jesus who said, if you don't love me above father, mother, dad, I mean, those are hard things. But what he meant by that was that it's not that we shouldn't love others and shouldn't love our families and, and shouldn't have love in our lives, but, but it will all be better if our focus is upon him and what he has for us. Everything will fall into place better somehow. Do we, and the question that I have for myself, and do we believe that? Or are we still hedging our bets on fellowship and, and, and our hearts have been bought by, by something else? They devoted themselves to the fellowship and the result was that they made sure that each person in the church was taken care of, which led them to, very often, selling possessions if necessary and giving the proceeds to those that had need. Now this is a description that happens more than once in the book of Acts with this Jerusalem church. It happens here in Acts 2, it happens in Acts 4, and again at the beginning of Acts 5. The practice apparently was that they were selling property, and they were bringing the, the, the proceeds of the property to the apostles who were apparently, at least at first, and they turned this over to deacons later, at least at first were managing the proceeds and handing out the proceeds to those who had need. That was how the church apparently was set up organizationally. And we know that from Acts chapter 4, or from Acts, that, that it became too big of a burden, and, and the apostles said, well, you know what, we can't keep doing this. We're going to have to get some other people to help, and they called them deacons. And they came along, and they started to administer what was going on. So that was, that was happening. Now, the question is this. If we're a spirit-filled church, should we be following this practice of selling things that we have in order to take care of others in our congregation? That's what was going on there. 
is it a practice that all spirit-filled churches will do is it is it specific to Jerusalem in other words is the scripture here being prescriptive is it telling us here's a prescription here's what you ought to do or is it being only descriptive in other words they are a spirit-filled church and for this church here's what it meant well let let's dig into this just for about five minutes or so because it's important it's important in this passage and it's important for the book of Acts and it's important even for, for Paul's uh, letters later there was likely in fact n not not just likely it was for sure great economic need came among the Christians in Jerusalem and this was the church responding to that great economic need many who came into the church were I guess for lack of a better term blackballed from the economy that was going on in Jerusalem much of the economy centered around temple worship and and so many people as they came into the church did lose their employment they lost their jobs they lost their means of income very often it happened in the Gentile world too we know from the Apostle Paul in places like Ephesus and others like that as people came to the church they had to switch careers they had to switch jobs and there was a great economic need we know in Jerusalem which was later on made worse by a great famine and so there was a lot of need going on there we know also from Acts that this was not mandatory. The apostles were not saying to the people in the church, you've got to do this. And that's really important. What was happening was a groundswell of voluntary action of people seeing needs within the congregation there in Jerusalem. And remember, they were meeting from house to house. There was no common place except for the temple area. They, were, they, they kept meeting there. But it was voluntary. We know that because as people were, it's described in Acts 4, Barnabas was one that's described. He voluntarily sold a piece of land, brought the proceeds, laid it at the apostles' feet. In chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira do the same thing and pretend to give the whole amount to the apostles while they held back some on their own. And as Peter is scolding them, and by the way, later God strikes them, it's, he, they're struck not because they kept some back, but because they kept some back and said they gave all of it. So in other words, there was hypocrisy, and God was not amused by it. And there was a strong lesson there in the early church. In fact, Peter said, look, when you sold it, was it not yours? You could have done whatever you wanted. So we know this, this, this action was voluntary. It was not, it was not the apostles saying, you, you will do this. It wasn't a, a, an edict coming down from on high. And so that is also important to note. Now, where did the money go? Who was it passed out to? Well, we know. We know from chapter 6 it was given to widows. And the reason it was given to widows probably first is because widows in the first century were economically very much deprived. And they needed help. They had no means of support. It, 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 was, it was bad news economically to be a widow. Most widows were poor, almost by definition. The word widow became, it meant almost poor. And so the church was taking care of those widows. Some of them we learned from chapter 6 were, were Aramaic-speaking widows, or, or Hebrew, and the others, some others were, were speaking Greek. They were all Jewish. And there was a complaint that the Hebrew ones were being given special treatment and the, the Greek-speaking ones were being left out, and that's when, that's when we get the deacons. But that was going on. And we know that the distribution that was happening, especially with widows, was probably not money, it was food. And so, the, so what was going on? The apostles and others were buying food and just and it was a daily distribution going on of food with the church there in Jerusalem who else was receiving it besides widows well it doesn't really say just those those who had need the church was organizing themselves to take care of those who had need now I'm going through this discipleship manual with with uh, with Mitch Bray and, and Guy Beach and and we just got through with the, with the chapter on justice and and it's very important to understand about about scripture when it's talking about those who are poor there are basically four categories that scripture describes as causing poverty one is voluntary in other words people just say I'm I'm gonna give up everything and I'm gonna pursue uh, my relationship with God it, you, it, it's it, it was on purpose there was a uh, a group called the Essenes in Jesus day who were very serious Jewish people it's like the first monastery and so it was a voluntary poverty I'm gonna I'm gonna give up things then there's calamity, just bad things happen, a drought or, or bad storms, and you, and you get wiped out. Your crops get wiped out. There's calamity. Uh, there's laziness. I just don't want to work today. All right? And, and the scripture is pretty clear that 
that's not an okay reason for poverty. Okay, uh, Paul goes so far as to say, if you don't, if you don't work, you're not going to eat. You, you, you've got it. You, that, that's not a good reason. The final one is is what the Bible really focuses on, and that's injustice. And that is people having things done to them by the powerful, which causes poverty, injustice. And that is the kind of poverty that Scripture deals with the most and, and wants the people of God to take notice of. That's why when we're praying for Christians around the world, we're praying for them because an injustice is being done to them, and we should care about that. We should be about establishing God's justice as much as we can on this earth. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's part of the Lord's Prayer, to alleviate injustice. And, and very often that is... That's where God says, I, I want you to step in and do what you can to alleviate this injustice, to alleviate the poverty that comes from it. So the point here is this, that a spirit-filled church will not turn its back on needs, especially needs that come from injustice and probably calamity. That, that the church will organize itself in a way that begins to, to deal with this kind of poverty. It's, it's the idea that what's mine is yours. I will not turn my back on you. You will never go hungry as long as you are in this community. You will be looked out for. That's what I see this church doing in Jerusalem. Tremendous generosity springing up, driven by the Holy Spirit. And voluntary. It, no edicts coming down from on high. It was, it, it was a groundswell of desire to take care of those, especially widows, who needed taken care of. So we need to fill in the blanks for us here. We know what we're doing uh, in this church with benevolent needs, and, and frankly, organizing is the biggest part of this. And we want to, frankly, do better. And, and, and over the course of time, we pray that we will. That, we, that, that a care for God's people is driven by the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that's what they did. They were, they were a loving church. Next, a spirit-filled church is a worshiping church. Again, verse 42 and on. And they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Worship and prayer were two of the essential habits. Did you catch that? Two of the essential habits of the early church. Based on biblical words for worship, I'm sorry, Finn. See you, buddy. Based on biblical words for worship, worship has to do with reverence, kind of what I prayed about earlier. It, we ha it's an awesome God, not, not a, a, a little guy. Reverence, submission, being thankful, and being willing to serve. All of those are words for worship in Scripture. And, and all of it's directed to God. One of the results of their worship was this general overall character was this. It, it's just a little phrase. An awe came upon every soul. They, they, they saw what was going on in their midst. And, and they were... They were awestruck. That word awesome has become, again, a, a terribly overused word in our culture, but they were struck by awe. Why were they? Well, because they understood that God was doing stuff, and they were amazed. And it was not this cheap, oh, bless me, bless me, bless me kind of thing that we, we often have. It was, I have no words kind of awe. It was being struck, oh my gosh, look what, look what God is doing. They were dealing with God and they knew it have you ever been there where you're dealing with God and you know it that produces awe that produces a sense that God is and it, it was it was both wonderful and frightening all at the same time that's kind of the way God is I mean you have a bona fide encounter with God Every encounter you have in Scripture of, of an angelic being or, or you know, something that, that, that God is doing is that. It's first oh, fear and then comfort and then 
What do I do? What do you want me to do? That's the normal progression when we have a bona fide encounter with God. And here's, here's the deal. And here's, here's what I pray for. Not only for me, I pray for it for my children. I pray for it for our church. We can teach scripture. We can, we can, we can do things out of obedience. But I can't have an encounter with God for you. And you can't have an encounter with God for me. Oh, I so wish I could do that for my kids sometimes, don't you? That, that it could, they could just have an encounter with God that is, that, that is truly undeniable and life-changing. And what was going on here is that these encounters were happening all over the place. And people had this sense of awe. They saw what was going on. They knew that the things that the apostles were doing, the, the signs and wonders that were, that were happening through them, it was awe-inspiring. They, they, they were not taking God cheaply like we do sometimes, or ignoring him. They couldn't. <laughs> it was too awe-inspiring. A.W. Tozer said, God wants worshipers before workers. Indeed, the only acceptable workers are those who have learned the lost art of worship. The very stones would praise him if the need arose and a thousand legions of angels would leap to his will, and he gives us the opportunity to worship him at any time. When we come together is one of those times. And it also says they devoted themselves to the prayers. And this was both this was both informal praying as they got together. And it was it was also, and I don't think we should minimize this, there were formal prayers. Okay, these were these were people coming from Judaism, and in Judy in, in, in temple worship there were formal prayers. Even Jesus, when he taught his disciples to pray, gave them a formal prayer. We shouldn't minimize that. Memorize. They were devoting themselves to both informal and formal praying as they, as they came together. And when you look through the book of Acts, prayer ex uh, 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 preceded every significant event. Every one. Every big-time event that happened in Acts was preceded by somebody praying or a group of people praying. The very coming of the Holy Spirit was preceded by them praying. Not doing, although praying is the best do that we could ever do. Praying is significant. The disciples we know asked Jesus how to pray. There was something about Jesus' prayer life which, which, was, which they wanted to catch. And they knew just instinctively that, that Jesus' prayer life was essential to who he was. And so they asked him about it. Now I, I want you to imagine again as these groups are meeting, the disciples, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, all the rest of the disciples that we mentioned last week, they're meeting in homes throughout Jerusalem. And, and let's just say that, that Nathaniel, all right, is, is leading, a, leading a little home group. And, and he's telling his group about how Jesus called him and, and how Jesus knew who he was before they even met. Because when Jesus first saw him, ah, oh, Galilean, who's there's no no deceit. He understood him. He knew him. And, and he would tell people about that, and, and, and then he would, he would tell them about what it was like to be around Jesus. And then very quickly, I think, he and the other disciples would probably say something like this. He said, you know, Jesus praying was the best part about being around him. It, it was the deepest. It was the thing that, that gave us the most curiosity. It was the thing that, frankly, frustrated us sometimes because we thought he was nuts going off and praying instead of doing something. But it was the be in retrospect, it was the best part about being around him. Because Jesus knew that for him, even for him, the Son of God, prayer was not an option. It was absolutely necessary. Spirit-filled people understand the importance of prayer. Finally, Spirit-filled church is an evangelistic church. Here's, what, here's what's described, verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. Make sure you see here in this passage that the Lord is adding to their number. Building the church, Jesus said, is mine. It's my job. I will build my church. And the gates of hell won't stand against it. And that's the way it's worded here. And God was adding to their midst daily those who were being saved. They were holding church in homes in lower Jerusalem. I have a little picture again. I'm just really briefly going to 
going to show it to you, uh, I think. All right, again, here's Jerusalem. Here's the temple, 40 acres. Most of the believers were meeting in this area down here in lower Jerusalem. We, we know from Pentecost there were at least 1,500 new believers. Jerusalem had about 40,000 people at this time. So 1,500 new believers turned loose in this section of Jerusalem, meeting from house to house. They weren't all selling their houses. <laughs> okay? Some people still had their houses. Uh, they were selling property perhaps outside Jerusalem, and, and that's where they were meeting. And that's what was going on. And Jerusalem was being slowly, actually not so slowly, very quickly turned upside down as these people were meeting in homes and, and talking to each other. And as these new Christians experienced Jesus. Now let's assume that one of the things the apostles were teaching these people was how to witness. Why can we assume that? Well, because the last thing Jesus said to them as he, as he ascended is when they asked him, are you going to establish the kingdom of Israel now? And he said... To paraphrase, none of your business when. Here's your business. Go be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and into the uttermost parts. So they had to be teaching them about being witnesses. What does a witness do? Tells their story, basically. Tells what they've seen and heard. Now, there were certain things going on in Jerusalem then that we can't reproduce today, right? Certain things going on. The, I mean, the, the very basic thing we can't reproduce it was if it happened during these people many of them had been with jesus when he was here on this earth they saw him the disciples certainly but many people in jerusalem did too so we have to assume that many of these new christians had experienced jesus in some way during his ministry many of them had perhaps been calling for his crucifixion on the day he was crucified they were there saying crucify him crucifying because they got all stirred up by the by the the, the Jewish leaders, many, I'm sure, had responded to the teaching of Jesus. Uh, to them, he seemed to be like a breath of fresh air in a stale religious world. They were compelled by what he was saying and how he was saying it. They had felt beaten up and left for dead by their religious leaders, and Jesus gave them real hope. And then he was dead. All of a sudden. All of a sudden, he was dead. And their hope their hope was dashed. I'm sure there are many people like that. They, okay, well, another one bites the dust. Another so-called Messiah gone. But then 50 days later, here come the disciples. He's alive. We've seen him. We want you to know about this. He, he's alive. Go check it out. You know where he was buried. You all know where he was buried. He ain't there. And yes, we know that they're saying that we stole his body. That just ain't true. I don't know if they said ain't. But they were Galilean, so they probably did. All right, and and so they and, and so people, I'm sure, went and checked it out. Yeah, there's the, it's empty. There's no body here anymore, and and they came to the realization the evidence was too heavy. Hope had returned. They believed. They got baptized. They joined this community, and 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 even members and other friends in Jerusalem, they were telling them about the day they experienced Jesus and, and came into the church. And this was going on like crazy in Jerusalem and numbers were being added day by day I think just by the sheer weight of the evidence that there was no body in that tomb and they remembered Jesus now we can't reproduce that today but what can we reproduce our stories you all have a story you're here because God has done something in your life or you wouldn't be here right I mean why if God hadn't done something why would you be here this morning you have a story I have a story my story is I was raised in a Christian home my parents were wonderful Christians and, and I was taught everything at a young age and it all got in here but it wasn't getting here enough and there came a point in my life where I needed it to be here more not just here and God met me in a powerful way that was undeniable to me Kevin Johnson was there that day Graham was there that day meeting of, of our elders in our church the prayer was give Mike what he needs and I did something happened during that prayer that even beginning to talk about it <laughs> I, I, I started the, the, the weight the power of that experience that I had with God that night didn't change what I did but it changed everything about me as a pastor that's my story you have a story too and, and God calls us to be witnesses, to, to tell your story. 
people can't deny your story. And if part of your story is to show people evidence of Christianity, great. I mean, I, I'm all for that. But don't lose the importance of your story in your context. And I believe that as the Spirit empowers our stories, He shows up first, and as we do that, God will add to our church those who are being saved, but we have to tell the story. We can do great things, we can do nice things, we can show people our good works so that they glorify our Father in heaven, but sooner or later we have to articulate our stories. We have to articulate the gospel. What God did in my life that changed me. And that's your story. That's your witness. And that's very simple. So here's, as we wrap it up, as the worship team comes up. Are you filled with the Spirit? Does the Spirit have a monopoly on you? Or does that honor go to something or somebody else? Let me say that again. Are you filled with the Spirit? You can be just by simply saying, Holy Spirit, I, I, I want your filling. I want, to be, I want to be influenced by you above all. That, that's all it takes, a desire. Does the Spirit have a monopoly on you? Or does that honor go to something or someone else? A way to tell if the Spirit has a monopoly on you and on me is if we have a passion for learning, for loving, for worshiping, and for witnessing. That's what God's Word clearly says here. So here's the next step. The Holy Spirit, is the Holy Spirit the biggest influence in your life? If not identify what is just admit it God already knows frankly you already know don't try to deny it admit it this week determine that you will allow the Holy Spirit to be your greatest inspiration and your most important influence spousal prayer father in heaven thank you for your word and thank you for that first century spirit filled church Lord we desire each one of us to be led and filled by your spirit and to have you add to our church those who are being saved. Thank you that you will use our stories in this process. We pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Now, as we close today, the ushers are going to come forward again. And if you've prepared an offering for our building, uh, then go ahead. This is the time to do that. If you didn't, don't worry about it. Plenty of opportunities to give. If you want more information about, about the campaign, and I'll find those brochures, tell our story, then come up to me afterwards and I'll give them to you. So let's all, you can stay seated. The ushers will come as we sing this last song. God bless you as you give.